Well, this morning we have a new chapter that we're working through in the 1689 London Baptist Confession of Faith. Um, it's, one, it's only one paragraph long. Normally we have uh, several paragraphs that we go through, but uh, they decided that this one would just take one paragraph. Um, could really go for quite some time just on this topic of adoption. And so to, thank you, Jose, um, to squeeze all this in is what was quite challenging uh, to say the least, because there's, like Greg would say, there's so much material, um, you know, to condense it all uh, <laughs> was quite a feat. So, I like to start off with this essential question: What is the difference between declared righteous, just being justified, and being adopted by Christ? So the difference between justification and adoption. So we've went through some of the uh, ordo salutis, the order of salvation. We went through justification. Uh, we went through election, justification, and now adoption. And so it brings us to the paragraph from chapter 12. All those that are justified, God vows saved, not, not your everyday word, in and for the sake of his only son, Jesus Christ, to make partakers of the grace of adoption, by which they are taken into the number and enjoy the liberties and privileges of the children of God, have his name put upon them, receive the spirit of adoption, have access to the throne of grace with boldness, are enabled to cry, Abba, Father, are pitied, protected, provided for, and chastened by him as by a father, yet never cast off, but sealed to the day of redemption, and inherit the promises as heirs of everlasting salvation. Now, there that's a rich paragraph. I mean, there's a lot in there. All the accompanying verses are there as well. Uh, I mean, you could spend months uh, just unpacking each one of those. But we don't have months. <laughs> we have minutes. And so uh, the outline of the chapter is, number one, the foundation of adoption. So it's recipients, uh, all those that are justified. That, that's the people of God. That's the saints of God. It's source, God, thou vouchsafed. I'm going to go over what that means. It's ground in and for the sake of his only son. And number two, the blessing of adoption, incorporation into God's family, reception of a familial disposition. That's a family disposition, experience of paternal treatment by God, paternal meaning father, reception of the promised inheritance. So this word vouchsafed, has anybody heard this word before besides Greg? All right, Mr. Shipsy, of course. <laughs> All right. It means to grant a special privilege or favor and or to bestow that favor in a gracious and condescending manner. Adoption is therefore described here as a great blessing, the pinnacle of God's condescending love. In other words, God had to bring his love down to us because we couldn't reach up to him. Adoption as to the glory, privilege, and intimacy with God conveyed by, by it is arguably the pinnacle of gospel blessing. 1 John 3, 1 through 3. There are 14 blessings mentioned in this confession. Maybe you didn't count uh, as we went along or didn't realize there were 14 blessings that were named and can be collated under the following four headings <clears throat> mentioned in this division as follows. Uh, blessings one through four, incorporation into God's family. Blessings five through seven, reception of a familial disposition. Eight through 14, experience of paternal treatment. And 14, reception of promised inheritance. But I'd like to do something a little bit different today um, in the way we unpack this. And uh, Brother Nick helped out a little bit with this as well, is look at the exposition of the chapter um, by unpacking some things that are not necessarily contained right in the paragraph. That'll be number one, adoption into the history of redemption. So we'll go through A, B, and C there. 
Uh, and then number two, adoption in the application of salvation. And we'll go through uh, those three sub points there. So here's our watershed text, um, which is our main text, Romans 8, 12 through 17. So then, brothers, we are debtors not to the flesh to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons by whom we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God and of children and heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with him in order that we may be glorified with him. Okay. So on the... Page two, if you'll turn there on your handout. Adoption in the history of redemption. So the biblical word for adoption, which is used five times in scripture and only in the New Testament, uh, means literally to place as a son. One of Nick's favorite words. All right, son. (laughs) The original son was Adam. So Adam is the son of God. Luke 3.38, when he began his ministry, Jesus himself was about 30 years old, being, as was supposed, the son of Joseph, the son of Eli, the son of Adam, the son of God. Sonship involves the concept of a shared nature, but it was lost when Adam fell. So Adam had a sonship, and then it was lost. Sonship afterwards referred to those in the covenant with God. Exodus 4, 22 to 23. Greg, would you read that off the page for us? Thus says the Lord, Israel is my firstborn son. And I say to you, let my son go that he may serve me. If you refuse to let him go, behold, I will kill your firstborn son. So kind of a play on words here, son and son. Um, and so God said, he looked at all of Israel and said, this is my firstborn son, right? Even though Israel wasn't necessarily the first nation, but he said, this is my firstborn son. If that, if Pharaoh didn't let him go, he was going to kill Pharaoh's firstborn son. God's firstborn son was more important than Pharaoh's firstborn son even though all children are created by God in the image of God. The typical son adopted Israel. Uh, Deuteronomy 32, 5 through 20. um, "Do Do you thus repay the Lord, O foolish and unwise people? Is he not your father who has bought you? You neglected the rock who begot you and forgot the God who gave you birth. The Lord saw this and spurned them because of the provocation of his sons and daughters. For they are a perverse generation, sons in whom there is no faithfulness. So what's the nature of this adoptive sonship? So here, right, speaking of Israel, it was national and typical. In other words, Israel was a type. Bondage in Egypt and redemption from Egypt form the framework of adoption presented as types of a more terrible slavery and a greater redemption, which we experience. Now, Israel was called a vine in Psalm 80, verse 8. You brought a vine out of Egypt. You drove out the nations and planted it. Uh, the language that Jesus used is uses in uh, John 15. He says, I am the true vine, right? And we're going to get there. In John 1, 11, it describes Israel as Christ's own. He came to his own, in other words, the vine, and his own people, his own vine, right, did not receive him. <clears throat> in John 8, 34, uh, 39 44, um, they answered him, Abraham is our father, And he said, you are of your father, the devil. The Jews were fixated on genealogy. Everything was about who they were related to. 
But who is Abraham the father of? Right? Father of the faithful. He's the father of the faithful. When they said Abraham's our father, Jesus didn't say, oh, that's right, you have full access into the kingdom. <laughs> it doesn't matter if that progeny is there, if that lineage is there. You are of your father, the devil, because it was the spiritual connection to Abraham that mattered, not the physical lineage. It didn't matter. Yes. Even, even Abraham was Abram. Right. He was a pagan. Right. God called him because of his faith in the true God. Then God changed his name to Abraham. You know, that's the first Jew by faith. There you go, you know? by faith. And so Abraham is the father of the faithful. And where is his promise fulfilled? In Christ, right. the true Israel. And Christ, in Christ, the promise is given to Abraham accrue to us. Romans 8, 17 says, and if children, then heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ. So what is our inheritance as children of God? The promises that God gave and God is our father. We get the promise and the relationship. What good is having the promises without the relationship? Somebody says, would you like everything heaven has to offer if Christ wasn't there? Would you want to be in heaven if Jesus wasn't there? Well, people in the world would say, absolutely. Who needs Jesus? I don't have him now. I don't need him later. But I would love to live in utopia, which humanity is trying to create on earth, which they cannot create. Do you want Abraham's promise of land? How about the descendants? You want a great name for yourself? You want all the nations of the earth to be blessed in you? Or do you want God? God loves us like his own son and he lavishes love upon us. When he looks at you, you know what he sees? He sees Christ. He sees Christ in you, the hope of glory. Uh, liberal Christianity has this concept of this universal fatherhood of God. I had a colleague that said, we're all God's children. I said, really? We're all God's children? Then why don't we have supposed children of God taking God's name in vain left and right, blaspheming God, living apart from his rules, living apart from his love, living apart from his truth, despising the, the love letter he gave. If we're all God's children, uh, there's also this, this concept that, that there's the brotherhood of man. J. Uh, Grisha Mechim said, very different is the Christian concept of brotherhood from the liberal doctrine of the brotherhood of man. The modern liberal doctrine is all men everywhere, no matter what their race, ethnicity, or creed are such brothers. There is a sense of truth here that all people are brothers in Adam because all men have the same creator in nature. However, the Christian knows a far more intimate relationship than a general one of man to man. And for this more intimate relationship, he reserves the term brother. True brotherhood is the brotherhood of the redeemed. So if you have an unsaved family member that's a male and you say, this is my brother, it's not the same as when you look your brother or sister in Christ in the face and you say, this is my brother. It, it means something entirely different because this brother, apart from Christ, will die and go to hell. This brother you will be with in paradise. All children are not God's children. Me. Yes, sir. Yeah, uh, since it's clear that the fatherhood is something where uh, it's different in the Godhead, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, that Jesus would be God, not me. And it is true that we were aliens and were adopted into the family of God. We see that in Ephesians 2.12, uh, that formerly we were aliens in the covenant of grace, being God David without God, but we were brought nigh by the blood of Christ. So it's also something I just wanted to say that uh, the believers are constituted as being members of God's family when they believe. So I would say, Elder, 
that what you are saying is correct, uh, that when you go to Ephesians 1 5, it also shows that we are predestined unto adoption, and finally, that J. Gresham Mason from the, I don't know, I know we're not allowed to say this, the Orthodox Presbyterian Church. <laughs> <laughs> the one that starts with the W. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we just got that one. <laughs> Well, in the middle of page 2, 1 John 1, 12 through 13. Um, Nick, can you read that, brother? See that in the middle of page 2? Oh. Oh. I was on the wrong page. <laughs> <laughs> That'll do it. <laughs> to all who did receive him. Who believed in his name, who gave the right to become children of God, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. Why would I need the right to be of God? That's okay. <laughs> Notice we have the words not, nor, nor, but. Not, nor, nor, but. So why do I need the right to become what I already am? If all people are God's children, why do I need the right to become something I already am? Because all people are not God's children. I need the right to become a children of God. I wasn't made a child of God in the flesh. I became a children of God because of Christ through the Spirit of God. Letter C, the substantial son, the adopted church. So Christ is the true Israel. Jesus said, I am the vine. John 15, 1. Christ is the last Adam. In Romans 8, 15 through 17, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons by which we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ provided we suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified with him. So we're made children. We weren't born. We weren't born children. No one is born a Christian. <laughs> you're made a Christian and you're only made a Christian by the spirit of God. You, you don't make yourself a Christian. You could say you grew up in a Christian family. You could say, well, my parents are Christians, but that doesn't make the children Christians automatically. We are heirs to God's promises because of our adoption in Christ. When you meet believers, well, professing believers on the street, and they say, yeah, you know, I'm a Christian. And I say, have you been born again? And they say, no. You can't be a Christian and not be born again. You must be born again because that means you're adopted. Ephesians 2, 1 to 2. And you were dead, not sick, in your trespasses and sins in once you once walked. So in other words, we no longer walk in that because we are children of God. 1 Peter 2, 9 through 10. Jose, please. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people fit, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellence of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Uh, verse 10, right? Yes. Okay. Two, uh, once you were, we were not a people, but now you're God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Where does all this language come from? It comes from the Old Testament. Peter is saying, you are all of those things that Israel is described as. You, here sitting, are a chosen race. Christ is the true and faithful Israel, and you are in Him. You are a royal priesthood. Christ is the true high priest, and we are in Him. You are a holy nation. That was said of Israel, is said of the true church. You are a people for His own possession. Deuteronomy 7, 6 through 8, we belong to him. And so this is saturated with references and promises made to Israel. Promises made to Israel 
are your promises. Now, this is the difference between dispensational theology, which people like John MacArthur and others would hold to. Uh, we hold to covenant theology, which means it continues on, right? So uh, love, uh, love MacArthur, uh, many of his teachings, uh, uh, much of his theology, but in this area, you know, I'm taking a right turn, saying, sorry, Mr. MacArthur, I'm going with Bob Shipsey's theology, right? <laughs> I'm saying God says to Isaiah, I mean, the Jews were God's people. But yes. He says, I'm going to raise up a people who are not a people. Right. To proclaim my praises. That's the church. Yes. You know. And so, uh, as we look here, also in Galatians uh, chapter 3, 25 through 29. Chuck, you have that, or is that too small there? Which one? Uh, number six, yeah. Galatians three twenty-five. Yes. But now that faith has come, we are no longer under a guardian. For in Christ Jesus, you are all sons of God through faith. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek, neither is there slave nor free. There is no male nor female. For all, for you all are one in Christ Jesus. And if you are Christ, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to promise. Abraham's offspring. Now, this would have made the Jews very upset. You can't be Abraham's offspring. You're not even circumcised. (laughs) You got a problem there, you know? (laughs) You don't eat shawarma. (laughs) You don't eat falafels. There's no way you can be a child of Abraham. Baptized into Christ. In union with Christ, Christ the Jew, Christ the Son of God, in him, Abraham's offspring is what we are. Heirs according to the promise. We're grafted in. In Romans 9, 6, it said, not all Israel is Israel. Because it was only believing Israel that was God's people. And God took believing Jews and Gentiles, and he made us one in Christ, Ephesians 2, 14 through 16. People who hated each other, Jews and Gentiles. You think uh, black and white in, in, in early American history, you think that was a problem? That was nothing compared to the Jews and the Gentiles. Nothing at all. And God takes people who are enemies, and he brings them together in Christ as adopted sons and daughters of the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords. I mean, this is really an amazing thing. In John 8, 38, again, they proclaim Abraham is our father. Jesus is no, your father's the devil. I mean, how's that for a tongue lashing? This is not the way to win friends and influence people. All right. And as a lot of people would say, well, Jesus, that sounds a little judgy as we hear. Don't judge. If that's not a just smack judgment, I don't know what is. It, Newsflash, it's okay to judge as long as you make a righteous judgment. <laughs> Galatians chapter 4, 1 through 7. Uh, Jenny, you have that? Mm-hmm. I mean that the heir, as long as he is a child, is no different from a slave. Though he is the owner of everything, but he is under guardians and managers until the date set by his father. In the same way, we also, when we were children, were enslaved to the elementary principles of the world. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, so that we might receive adoption as sons. And because you are sons, God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. So you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir through God. Hmm. So this is not formality. This is not filing paperwork in heaven. But intimacy, and now because we love him, we hate which is evil. We hate things that our father hates. This doesn't please, I'm an adopted son or daughter of the king. This doesn't please my father. We don't belong to the flesh. The sins of the flesh don't belong to us. What is the nature of this adoptive sonship? It's corporate and substantial. The church's adoption through God's son gives blessings far beyond temporal privileges bestowed upon the national adoption of Israel, where they said, here's your land, here's your name, here's your promise. We get something so much greater. We get God. 
The sonship imparts the blessings of the indwelling spirit and the internal inheritance. We get everlasting life. There were all kinds of people that claim Abraham is our father that went to hell. <laughs> our next page. I think sorry, our, Phil, I want to ask a question. That, yes, I'm sorry, same page. You know this, that, uh, as far as John Murray is concerned, and also William Perkins on the Royal Salutis, I imagine that that was brought out in the study that uh, adoption would uh, fall hold in right after justification, which is four, and adoption would be number five. Now, would you say that adoption, uh, we are constituted at that point as members of the family of God, and then in uh, justification, we are constituted as righteous. So it's almost the same, right? As far as uh, that is concerned, when you go through the seven stages, which you and I did six years ago, uh, so uh, what I'm saying is justification, uh, adoption follows. So adoption is like more or less the same uh, in that regard, where we're constituted righteous, and here we're constituted being members of the family of God. Amen. <laughs> I can't, I mean, you, you, you can't add anything to that. Um, we have uh, conversion, justification, adoption, sanctification, glorification. Uh, it's, it really is the whole package. And adoption leads to assurance of salvation. Romans 8.16. Um, Emily, can you read that verse there for us? Kind of in the middle of page 3. The Spirit Himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. So now this does not mean, you can't tell me I'm not a Christian. I know in my heart I'm a Christian. That's no different than a Muslim, a Muslim, a Mormon saying, I had a burning in my bosom. Said, no, that was the pepperoni. You know, it doesn't mean you're saved. <laughs> um, <clears throat> 2 Corinthians 13, 5 states, examine yourself to see whether you're in the faith. Test yourself. So Paul said, examine yourself, test yourself. He gave a double barrel shotgun there for us. Or do you not realize this about yourself, that Jesus Christ is in you unless you fail to meet the test? So there are those who claim to be Christians that must examine and test, and some who only claim to be Christians and are not born again, they will fail to meet the test. Now, where's the test? <laughs> right? And I... Uh, you can look some of this up on your own, but in First John, three tests of, ins- of assurance of salvation, and there are more tests than three throughout First John. Test number one, the test of truth. When you meet someone who says, I'm a Christian, you can't tell me otherwise. Do you believe the gospel? What is the gospel? If they don't know the gospel, they don't know Christ. Test number two, the obedience test. Do you walk in righteousness? Right? They're out there smoking weed, they're smoking a bong, they're, they're drinking alcohol, they're cursing like a sailor, they're blaspheming God's name, they're not walking in righteousness. Right? Test number three, the love test. And I want to park on this one just for a moment. Do we love the brothers and sisters? So, um, what happened there? Also that your joy might be filled, and if you love me, keep my commandments. Absolutely. Absolutely. And so, these tests give assurance of salvation. This is why church membership matters. Not just attending, but church membership. Because your doctrine and life must match in a biblically functioning church. Because you can come along and say, I'm a child of God. And the church examines you and say, no, you're not. And the church has the authority to do that because judging by the word of God not just, I don't like your shoes, you're not a Christian. I don't like the kind of shirt you wear, you're not a Christian. That is, it's nothing outward, but if the outward, but if the life doesn't manifest what you claim to have within, you're not a believer. That's why church membership matters. Can you be filled with God's spirit by repulsed, but repulsed by your siblings in the faith? I love God. I just don't need to go to church. I can worship God at home. So, in other words, you're repulsed by the people of God. No, I love other Christians but yet you won't gather with them and become a member of a local church. Can you be filled with the Spirit of God yet have no yearning to gather with the saints? 
Um, I, I know someone who who, um, who left a heretical church, and I'm glad she did, and now her church is in Texas, but she lives in the Bronx. So you have a pastor in Texas who doesn't even know your name, that you're not a member of that church at all, and you go to the supermarket to buy elements for communion that on the other side of the screen they're partaking in together, but you're on your couch alone watching a YouTube video of it and doing it by yourself. It's not biblical. The adoption in the application of salvation. The progressive, the progression of adoption. In Romans 8, 15 through 16 and verse 23, for you have not received the spirit of adoption of slavery. And in the end, it says, as we wait eagerly for adoption as sons, the redemption. Actually, let me read the whole thing. This is important. For we, for you have not received a spirit of slavery leading to fear again, but you have received a spirit of adoption as sons by which we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit testifies that we are children of God who have the first fruits of the Spirit. We groan inwardly as we eagerly await for adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. So we have like, Two things going on here, so to speak. We have, we are adopted now, but then as we eagerly wait for adoption, how can we be adopted now and then eagerly wait for it? Houston, do we have a problem? I'm adopted right now, but I'm eagerly, but I'm eagerly waiting for my adoption. Why would I eagerly wait for something I have right now? It's called the complete fulfillment of the adoption in heaven, is that it? Yeah, we're sealed with the spirit. We're the not Italian glorified. theologian speaks again. Yeah. Amen. You're correct. I'm not glorified. Right. I'm united with him. The Holy Spirit. Still walking by faith. Unregenerated body is a is showing, knowing this that the old man was crucified, that the body of sin might be destroyed. That's the key. You have the Holy Spirit in you. You have uh, the, the same resurrected soul at the point of salvation. Which you know, Bill, but it's the body that's my problem. And mine too. <laughs> and all of ours. <laughs> right. So the Holy Spirit liberates, uh, He's emancipated you, He set you free, and you didn't set yourself free. And so we're dri- we were driven as self-centered slaves to our sin. And now you can actively leave the plantation of your sin. We can cry, Abba, Father, Daddy, Papa. And the striking difference in these distinction uh, time references, when does adoption take place in Romans 8.15? A conversion. When does adoption take place in Romans 8.23? At the resurrection. So we have it now and yet it's coming. We got it on both ends. We got the bookends. <laughs> it can't get better than that. This dual perspective is illustrated by Roman adoption customs. Roman adoptions consisted of both a private ceremony in which a person was legally adopted and a public ceremony in which he was openly declared to be a son. You all saw the Lion King, right? They had the son and then he went up to Pride Rock and he said, my son, and he held it out for everybody to see. That is, that's what's going to happen in heaven. My sons for everybody to see. Paul does not see two distinct adoptions, but one adoption now legally possessed, but then openly shown and displayed. 2 Corinthians 6, uh, 17 through 18. Therefore, go out from their midst and be separate from them, says the Lord, and then touch no unclean thing. Then I will declare to you, And I will be a father to you, and you shall be sons and daughters to me, declares the Lord God Almighty. Let's turn to our last page. The definition of adoption. It's a change in the legal status from slave to son of God, which takes place by faith at the moment of union with Christ but publicly revealed at the resurrection. Teaches catechism, and I would encourage everybody to memorize this. What is adoption? Julia, what is adoption? Adoption is an act of God's free grace, providing or receiving 
Amen. She's 11. If she could do it, y'all could do it. <laughs> Adoption is fundamentally a legal status, John 1, 12. Adoption flows from electing grace, Ephesians 1, 4 through 5. Adoption comes through faith in Christ, Galatians 3, 26. And adoption instantly gives us the spirit of adoption. Finally, let us see the blessing of adoption. In other words, this is so what? So what you're adopted? Well, number one, that means you're incorporated into God's family. From the confession taken into the number to enjoy the liberties, privileges as heirs of God, children of God, and fellow or joint heirs with Christ. I mean, secondly, reception into familial or familial disposition. Receive the spirit of adoption have access to the throne of grace with boldness and are unable to cry, Abba, Father. You couldn't do that before. Experience a paternal treatment by God. Are pitied, protected, provided for, and chastened by Him. He could say, you're in sin. You need to get right with me, keeping short accounts with me, yet never cast off. And reception of the promised inheritance. You're sealed to the day of redemption and you inherit the promises as heirs of salvation. You're sealed. The king would take the ring and seal the letter. It had the king's seal on it. You have the king's seal upon you. Can anyone break the seal on you? No. Because it was sealed by the king. You can't unseal what was sealed by the king. Back to our essential question. What's the difference between declared righteousness, being justified, and being adopted by Christ? What's the difference? What is justification? Declared righteousness. It's a declared righteousness. It's a legal term. But getting new natures. Yes. But adoption is a family term. You have the legal and you have the family. We're declared righteous, but we're actually seen as righteous because we are adopted as sons of God. Hence, when God looks at you, he sees Christ and he loves you as much as he loves his own son. Mind blown. You look at yourself in the mirror knowing all your sinful things that you've done five minutes ago, and you go, how in the world can God love me as much as he loves his perfect, righteous, sinless son? Yet he does. Your eyes don't see the same way his eyes see, do they? We see through a glass, we see through a mirror dimly. Our sight has not been perfected. It's been majorly cleared up. But when Jesus touched the man who was blind, he said, what do you see? He said, I see men like trees. And he touched him again. He said, what do you see now? He said, I see clearly. Our sight, we're, we can see Christ, that he saved us, but it's still being made more clear and clear as we grow in Christ and become more like him. Let me close with two Quotes, one from John Frame, adoption is God's remedy for our second greatest need. Justification meets our need for a new legal status. Adoption meets our need for a new family. We needed a new family. Because apart from that, Jesus said, you are of your father, the devil. We, that's enough to say I need a new family. Charles Spurgeon will give him the final word. Adoption gives us the right of children. Regeneration gives us the nature of children. We are partakers of both of these because we are sons and our daughters. The rights of children and the nature of children, these are, these are the things that are ours. This is the word that the Spirit accomplishes in us. Maybe you didn't realize that about yourself. You're adopted. Amen. Let's pray. Father, thank you, Lord, that we are adopted as children of God. 
We could not adopt ourselves. We couldn't make ourselves children. We could have declared we're children, but really our father was the devil until the Spirit of God came upon us, caused us to repent and conversion. You made us and adopted us as children of God from all walks of life, from all different ethnicities, and you made us one family in Christ. The world can only hope to do what you have done, but the world can't do what only you can do. And so, Father, thank you that although the world is trying to do what is impossible to bring everyone together into one sort of utopia of agreement, only God can do what you have done in Christ by the power of the Spirit. And so we thank you and praise you for our identity as adopted sons and daughters of the King of Kings, of our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.